Hello and good evening and welcome to the Comics Experience Graphic Novel Club, the Comics Masterpiece Edition. And, you know, if um, uh, if there's a book that fits the Comics Masterpiece, uh, uh, you know, theme and brand, it's, it's this, it's Marvel's. But here we are, we're starting the show, and I want to welcome you, Kurt, and I want to I wanna, uh, say hi to you, and thank you for doing this, and, uh, and thank you for writing this book, and thank you for writing all the things that you did. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. By all means. Um, um, you know, the first question is always the same first question, because it's my favorite question of all time. Uh, why comics? Of, of all the things you could be doing in your life, of all the ways you could be wasting your time, what is it? about comics that is that is your thing it's what makes you in your heart go ah this is this is this will set the tone for our conversation because i have a long answer to that i know you do and uh and and the way it goes is my parents met in the early 50s right around the time that that seduction of the innocent was a big thing and the congressional hearings on on, on crime comics and stuff like that were a big thing. So there was a rule for their kids um, that uh, that we weren't allowed to read comics. Um, uh, they didn't like outlaw all comics. They had newspapers to collections, uh, Pogo comics, things like that. Um, and they, they actually went out and bought Asterix and Tintin comics in multiple languages in hopes that we would uh, we would get interested in languages. My sister, my older sister, uh, became a language specialist in the, in, in the army. Um, so clearly it worked on her. And I learned to say, these Romans are crazy in uh, all modern European languages. Uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, so well, you know, one out of two ain't bad. Um, uh, but, but I, I liked the comics I read in the newspapers and I liked the comics, you know, I read 10 ever loving blue eyed years with Pogo over and over and over and over again. Um, but when I would read American newsstand comic books, uh, I would generally buy one in the local drugstore and read it while I was walking home. Um, and because I wasn't supposed to be reading comics, um, I would then store it under a flat rock in the back of the neighbor's yard, and it would turn fairly rapidly back into the wood pulp from which it sprang. Um, but one time in in uh, late 1974, I picked up Daredevil 120, and Daredevil 120 was like crack cocaine for me because I loved series books. I would go to the library and I would look for any any author who had read a, who had written a lot of books because if they had the odds are, are there was a series in there and that meant if I liked a book I could find out what happened next. And Daredevil 120 was the start of a four-part story where Daredevil fights Hydra um uh and and Tony Isabella had decided that that all of the section chiefs of Hydra were going to be you know, except for like one of them, villains we'd seen before. So that issue started off a story that said, oh, and you saw this guy in Strange Tales and you saw this woman in Marvel team up and this person was over in Iron Man. And and so he told me not only that this was a series that had a history, you know, in the beginning there was a scene where Daredevil and the Black Widow go to a New Year's Eve party at Foggy Nelson's apartment. And the Black Widow is pissed off at Foggy because he had at one point put her on, on trial for the crime of being a Russian. And there was a little footnote to Daredevil 83. Um, she was actually on trial for murder, but, um, uh, but she was innocent, of course, because she's a Marvel superhero. And... Uh, uh, but still, that told me that stuff that had happened four years ago still mattered. And that was kind of exciting. And then the story also told me that stuff that happened in the entire other series also mattered. So it was kind of like if the Oz books had the Hardy Boys yeah. show up in it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And not only that, but there was the letter column in that issue didn't have any letters in it. 
it was a history of Hydra and wow. it was continued in the next issue. So, yeah. so every piece of that book said, do you like continuity in your fiction? Yeah. Here it is. Yeah. 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 You have ever seen before. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and by the time the second issue came out, I had found a comic book store in, uh, in Harvard square, the millionaire picnic. Um, and I started buying other comics and branching out and, uh, and, and, and that was, you know, that was the beginning of me getting hooked on comics. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so like, and like it plugs into your limbic system kind of right. Like, like that, yeah. that just, that just hit of like, like, wow, there, this existed before me and it's, I don't know, I could see what it's, it could be a future, right? The, the comic for me was, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't even remember the issue number that, that, cause I don't care about the issue number part, but the, uh, uh, it was a Justice League with uh, with the key and Santa Claus is dead in the snow. It was a it was a hundred page giant and it That's had a JSA backup in it as well. And it also introduced John Stewart. Well, it didn't introduce John Stewart. Uh, right, but, that's the one where Hal Jordan slips in the shower and knocks exactly, him. and he hits his head, and the ring flies off. And is like, I gotta go find John Stewart, and I was like, right. What the fuck is that? That's the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. That's you know? part of the Lenoine run, and it's Lenoine and Dick Dillon and Dick Giordano. It's yep. it, it's it's one of the all time primo Justice League runs. Yeah, yeah, and it yeah. just it oh, just Hal Jordan just knocks you as a as a as a reader like that. You wow, there's this whole fictional thing here that it's clearly bigger than I could even think about, you know, like not, there's not just two green lanterns in the first story. There's a third one. Who's a golden age green lantern in the backup story. Like, wow, that was, that blew my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And with me, it wasn't even, you know, it's, it's not like these, these villains who were Hydra section chiefs were like big, important villains. There was like man killer, Right, and, right. and Commander Kraken, I think, was one of them. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was just the fact that that there was this whole world, yeah, and the world didn't. I mean, I I read comic strips in the newspaper, yeah. so I would read things like I don't know the Jackson Twins or Steve Roper and Mike Nomad, and and I would see that you know linear continuity of day to day yeah. as the story would build. But this also had parallel continuity, kind of horizontal continuity, um, because because you know there were other series. Um, there was something called Marvel Team Up, and there was there was there was there was something called Iron Man, and I had this vague sense of what this was. But when I went to the comic store, when I found that comic book store, um, I didn't. Um, I didn't just say, oh, look, more comic books. I will buy these new comic books. I immediately caught on to the fact that they had back issues. And I thought, oh, maybe they have that that Daredevil 83 where the Black Widow was put on, on trial for the crime of being a rush. They didn't, thank God, because I'm sorry to everybody involved. They're enormously talented. That's a terrible, terrible issue. Um, but, <laughs> I mean, seriously yeah no it is yeah it, it's yeah, it's, yeah. it's like it's like laid out by barry smith and it's 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 the finished pencils are by like alan weiss and then it's inked by bill everett these are all world-class comic book creators yeah who should not have word been working together no. um yeah. and the story is one where where the the the, they're they're chasing some villain like the ox or somebody like that, and 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 the writer isn't sure quite how to end it, but he needs to be dramatic. So the ox turns out to be a robot and blows up, and and so all the charges against the Black Widow are dismissed, even though all the evidence just blew up, and there were no witnesses except for, you know, the, the Black Widow and Daredevil. Um, it didn't make any sense. No. It's the one issue of Daredevil in years up to that point that Gene Colan didn't draw. Yeah. Um, so, so, so it's a very, very good thing that I went looking for Daredevil 83 and I found like Daredevil annual number one, which dumb me, I thought that was Daredevil number one. Um, and I, <laughs> I, I 
I picked up a, a couple of issues of Daredevil and one of the boxes of back issues, you know, there were issues in the, in the front for display. Um, and one of them was X-Men 37 and X-Men 37 had a cover that really hooked me that made me go, what is this series about? This looks like, you know, a John Christopher science fiction novel with costumes. Um, so I bought that. Um, and I bought Tales of Asgard special number one under the impression that it was Thor number one. Um, uh, and I, so I, I brought home this clutch of new comics and, and maybe like six back issues. Um, so when I started reading Marvel comics after that first, you know, hit of Daredevil, um, I was going backwards as well as forwards at the same time. Yeah. Um, I was, I was exploring that universe and that was just, oh boy, give me more. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I, I want to I want to uh, just stop for a second and go back to your parents, uh, uh, like liking comics in, in strip form and 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 making sure that that was there for you, I, I, like before there were graphic novels, right? Like you actually had access to stuff that, that that's pretty amazing. It's pretty rare that you have parents that 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 uh, uh, felt that way about the medium. Well, my parents didn't buy the newspaper strip collections for the kids. Yeah. And oh, yeah. My, we had 10 of our 11 blue eyed years with Pogo because, because they liked Pogo. Yeah. Uh, by the time I saw that book, it was beat to crap. You know, the, the, the binding was falling apart. You know, I can't imagine that it was one of my dad's books. So my mother must have just, you know, read it or inherited it. You know, somebody, uh, somebody loaned it to her, one of her sisters, whatever. It was a well-loved book by the time yeah. I saw it. Um, but the, but the Asterix and Tintin books, they specifically reacted to the fact that, well, comics, I don't know if they read something that said comics were an educational tool. Yeah. Um, uh, but they just thought maybe this will, this will hook them into being interested in languages. So they didn't, present them to us yeah you know my, my mom was pretty smart at one point i i asked her what you know um how did you how did you you know we grew up uh, we were also not allowed to uh to watch television unless it was television that they that they approved of and we would watch captain kangaroo it was one of the shows they let us watch but captain kangaroo had commercials right in the show as did a show called romper room where captain kangaroo would have like the rice krispies train go by and he talked <laughs> about rice krispies yeah. and and i knew from a very early age that that was a bad and a very unethical thing to do and my mom told me it was because we'd be watching it and she'd say oh isn't that awful she wouldn't tell us that's awful She'd say it like we already agreed with her. Yeah. Oh, it's that awful. Look, the horrible way they do that. And we go, oh, yeah, yeah, mom. And 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 so so the the comics were there, the 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 graphic albums. Um, maybe they'd been gifts for my oldest sister, and I just didn't know it. Um, but they were just they were there in the bookshelves that were in the what we thought of as the sewing area, because it's where the sewing machine was, mm -hmm. um, but it was a whole wall of bookshelves. And, and I'd go there and I'd pick out books. That was where the couple of Oz books we had were. That was, that was where various, you know, that was where the, the Pogo book was. I know exactly where on the shelf it was, but one bookcase over three shelves down, that was where the tinted books were. Right. Uh, and, and so it felt like something that I had discovered. It didn't feel like something that had been handed to me. Nice. Um, uh, that I also asked her at one point, you know, when I had kids, um, I don't, I can't remember not being able to read because I learned to read when I was like three or four. Yeah. Um, I, and I asked her, how did you get us to learn to read so, so young? And she said, I didn't do a thing. Your sister was in first grade. And she was reading, she was learning to read. And, and 
Robin, you know, next one down, was in kindergarten and she saw Amy learning to read. And she said, I want to do that. I want to yeah. do what my cool older sister is doing. And you were a year and a half younger and you saw them learning to read. And you said, I want to do that. <laughs> and then a year and a half later, there's Faith. And Faith was too young to be aware of what we were doing. So Faith didn't learn to read until, you know, kindergarten, first grade. And when she did, Jenny, the youngest, saw Faith doing it and said, I want to do that. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, so my mom just let us see what the others were doing and go, yeah, yeah. well, that is cool. I must be, I must, I must learn to do this. Yeah. Uh, uh, so as a result, you know, I, I learned to read very, very young. Um, and I literally don't remember ever not being able to read. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that. I, 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 I love that story. Um, well, uh, if I recall correctly, you sold your first comic strip and you were still in high school, right? Um, the first professional comic strip I sold, the first <laughs> professional Marvel DC strip, uh, script I sold, yeah. um, I sold on the Thursday before I graduated from college. There you go. Okay. But Not high school, so college. Okay. What you might be remembering is that when I was in high school um, with Scott McCloud, um, we did a benefit comic for the Boston. Yeah. That was, was 76, 77, maybe 78. I'd I'd have to look it up. Um, But, but Scott, you know, uh, two houses away from Scott, uh, a friend of his named Chris Bing lives, lived. And Chris's mother was on the junior committee, which is a fundraising committee for the Boston Pops. And one year they decided they were going to do as their as their opening concert of the season, they were going to do Comic Heroes Night. So they were going to do like, you know, the the Batman theme and the and the Lone Ranger theme and stuff like that. And her task, her committee's task was to come up with ways to fundraise off of this. Um, and her son, Chris, who was a, a would-be artist at the time, um, uh, said, well, why don't we do a comic book? We'll have, you know, Marvel and DC heroes in the comic book and you can sell it and make money for the pops. Um, and she said, well, who would do the comic? And he said, well, I'd draw it. And, and, and McLeod down the street, he likes comics. And his buddy, Kurt Busick, he likes comics. We'll, we'll do it together. So... So the, literally the Boston Pops Orchestra contacted Marvel in D.C. and said, can we do this? And and Marvel in D.C. said, well, it's, you know, fundraising for the PSO. Uh, that that seems like a good thing. So we literally, we, you know, we, we were teenagers and we got legal permission to do uh, what was at the time the second official uh, Marvel D.C. crossover. Yeah. Uh, and, and did you understand how insane that was at the time? No, no. Oh. I mean, and literally, you know, Chris, <laughs> Chris was kind of a big talker. You yeah. know, Chris, Chris was like, yeah, we'll do this. We'll do that. Um, and Chris talked his mom into it and mom talked the, the, the BSO into it. So all Scott and I heard was, yeah, we're doing it. Um, and Scott ended up laying out the comic. I wrote it. Um, uh, Chris drew it and uh, Richard Howell lettered it because he was the only guy we knew who lettered. He was at the time working on his his Porsche Prince um, uh, small press comic. And yeah. he was, we knew him because he was a, a cashier at the Millionaire Picnic. Um, and literally, you know, Scott became Scott. I became me. Richard went on to a career in comics. And, and Chris Bing is a Caldecott Award winner. Um, yeah. he's, uh, he's a, uh, a, a, a very well-respected, uh, professional illustrator who's got award-winning children's books out there. So it's just sort of like this nexus of magic where everybody who worked on that, um, uh, went on, not necessarily to comics, but to a career doing the stuff we were doing there. Even during the concert, it was, um, the comic was projected as a slideshow and it was narrated by a local radio troupe 
called The Hour of the Wolf Matinee. It was headed up by a DJ named Robert Desiderio. And Robert Desiderio went on to uh, star in TV shows. Nothing really all that long lived. Um, but it's just like everybody who worked on that comic went on to 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 bigger, better things. Yeah, it was it was it, it was it's kind of astounding. Uh, it is kind of astounding. Yeah, and that and that you were still in high school. That's that's I to, I don't know. I, I, when Scott told me the story, I, I was like, "What? How can that even be?" I, I yeah, yeah. It was just. Chris didn't know this was insane. Yeah. So he sold his mom on the idea and she didn't yeah. know it was insane. So she sold the rest of the committee on it. And the rest of the committee asked Marvel and DC and Marvel and DC didn't go this, this punk Kurt music who writes us letters wants to do a crossover. They said the Boston <laughs> symphony orchestra wants to do a fundraiser using our character. Yeah. Um, and so they said, well, well, okay. Yeah, yeah. You, maybe five years later, they wouldn't have done it. Exactly. Yeah. Because five years later, they'd have been paying more attention. But as yeah. it was, um, uh, Saul Harrison came up for the concert. He came up from DC. He sat at our table. He didn't speak to us because I think he'd noticed these are, you know, moron punk kids. Um, <laughs> But but he got he got free tickets to the season opener of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. He was not going to pass that up. Nobody from Marvel came, so so they they apparently didn't care as much um, about uh, about about being at the at the Pops opening night. But it was it was it was a weird experience, and it didn't you know it didn't help us in our careers any any at all because I mean it did because we got some practice, but. But nobody, you know, still today, I've been talking about this comic in interviews, and so has Scott for 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 forty years now. Uh, there's still nobody nobody knows about it. You know, the number of people who go, "Oh, that comic existed," is yeah. is very very small. Do you do you still own a copy? I, I have a copy. Yes. You do? Okay. Yeah. Um. Uh. Scott has a copy. Uh. Scott's mom has a copy. Um. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and at some point when I'm more organized, um, at one point I talked to, um, like, uh, I forget what they're called now back. They used to be, uh, actor, which was the wrong acronym mm -hmm. for, for a comic book. Uh, you know, they, 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 they raise funds for, for comic book creators who, who need help. Yeah, for um, a number of times, yeah. Uh yeah, but I I you know, I'd like to reprint the book. Yeah. As a fundraiser. Again as a fundraiser. You yeah. know, maybe we'll we'll you know get Chris to do, do a new cover um and put interviews in the back and talk about what it is and sell it to make money for for uh, for that. Um uh but you know that will require a little bit more spare time than yeah. any of us have at the moment. So and so it'd be nice to make it available again because, you know, it's not very good, but <laughs> it, 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 it has a certain um, historical... It. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It, it, it's a significant, albeit virtually unknown, uh, comic. I mean, it, yeah. it's, it's... Putting it together was was a mess. Scott, Scott did layouts. Uh, Chris followed them at some times and not at other times. Chris procrastinated to the point where when he realized he had to draw all these Boston area backgrounds, um, he finally said, screw it, and went and took photographs of all the backgrounds and pasted them into the art. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so, uh, uh, so it would, it would, it would save him some time. Um, and, and, you know, it's the end result is it's an interesting artifact, and 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 the story of how it came to be is more interesting yeah. than the the story of of that's in the comic. <laughs> it, it's, got, it's got Arthur Fiedler in it. It's got yeah. I think it's got John Williams in it. It's got Seiji Ozawa in it. It's got it's got Michael Dukakis in it. Wow, and it's got Superman, Batman, Robin, Wonder Woman. Um, 
uh, Spider-Man, Captain America, the Human Torch, and the Submariner, um, uh, all coming to Boston to rescue the BSO from a from a mad scientist who has uh, shrunk them down tiny and keeps them in a pocket watch to play music for it. Awesome. Yeah. That sounds great. <laughs> it, actually, it sounds terrible, but it sounds great. <laughs> well, it, it, it is both of those things. It's both, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, when did you when did you know that you wanted to write comics or was that even like the goal? From very early on, I wanted to be a writer. Um, I wanted to write stories. The first story I ever started, you know, I, I ever started writing as far as I know, I wanted to write an, a, an Oz novel. It was about a guinea pig who who on a toy sailboat got lost and and wound up you know in oz kind of like button bright <laughs> and I, I i drew an illustration and i wrote like three paragraphs of it and i still have it somewhere in the basement um but but you know to some degree i i i'm lazy and timid um and at the time i thought i understand enough about the idea of learning how to write to know that writing a novel is going to take like a year. And at the end of the year, you're going to be done with your novel and it's going to suck because you've never done it before. And then you have to do it again. And you might have to do it multiple times before you get good enough to actually sell a novel. And that was, that was really, really intimidating to me, you know, and, and in the idea of writing short stories, um, for some reason didn't occur to me. Maybe it was just because I was a library kid and a bookstore kid and I saw more novels than I saw short story collections. Yeah. And I didn't really understand that there was a market for short stories. Not that there was a huge market for them back in the 70s. Um, but I, um, I started reading comics in 1974 and 1975 and it occurred to me that at that time, comics were only 17 pages long. I thought if you do something that's 17 pages long and it stinks, so what? <laughs> you know, how much work was 17 pages? So that was when I, I had already talked Scott into, into starting to read comics. Yeah. Um, that within those first six months of my reading comics, I managed to put together a near complete collection of the original X-Men and I loaned it to Scott because I didn't have anybody to talk the comics about right. and Scott read it and, 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 and liked them well enough to get interested in comics. Um, I know this all happened in six months because the first comic I bought was Daredevil 120 and the first comic Scott bought was Warlock nine and they came out six months apart. Um, uh, I even remember, you know, Scott taking that off the rack uh, at, the, at the Millionaire Picnic. Um, so that was a crowded six months. Um, but but Scott liked to draw. Scott was heavily, heavily into spaceship design. He would he would draw blueprints of of uh, interstellar spacecraft and he'd figure out where all the bathrooms were. It was, uh, you know, it was it was obsessive. What Scott, um, yeah, but huh. uh, but uh, but you know, I thought, well, maybe we're talking about comics a lot. Maybe we can do a, a this this. You know, I I targeted. We'll do a fifteen page story, um, and and uh, uh, he uh, you know maybe he could draw it, and he was up for that, and so we came up with a story that was about four Marvel superheroes beating the crap of four, out of four other Marvel superheroes at our high school. Um, this, you know, clearly great plotting there. And the whole idea was we'd do this in 15 pages and it would stink, but we'd have fun and we'd learn something. Um, by the time we were done with it, we had been working on it for three years. It was 60 pages long. Um, it was terrible. But what I didn't, what I didn't understand back when I was thinking, wow, you work for a year on a novel and it stinks was you're going to learn a lot over that year. Yeah. Um, by the time we finished the battle of Lexington, as it was called, 
it was, like I said, it was 60 pages long. It was virtually plotless. But the last 15 pages are good storytelling. The first 15 pages are terrible storytelling. Right. So by the time we got through to the end, we knew a lot more about what we were doing. And we had both fallen in love with the, 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 the form of comics. This is something that I really need to apologize to Scott's mother for. for <laughs> because, you know, he was going to go to MIT. He was going to be a scientist. Right. Now he's, he's still a scientist. It's just a different science. But, but that, you know, the fact that we were working on that comic is what made Chris Bing say, I could rope these guys into helping me do a comic for the Boston Pops. Um, he, he had seen what we were uh, what we were working on. He knew we were interested in. in we sort of knew how, what we were doing. Um, so it all it all connects. Yeah, I love it. Uh, let's can we let's jump forward to the book because I feel like if we if we actually keep doing this in kind of chronological order, this yeah. is going to take a really really long time. Um, where did where did Marvels itself come from? Well, for that, you know, I kind of have to go back to those early days again. Um, yeah. uh, because, That's why I wanted to set the stage. Right, right. That's absolutely. It's very skillful on your part. Um, uh, I would walk to school, and I wouldn't think, "Boy, what if I was Spider Man?" You know, "Boy, what if I was Superman?" The the, the whole you know, adolescent power fantasy aspect of comics didn't didn't work the same way with me as it did with other people. I thought, what it would what would it be like to see Spider Man vault over that telephone pole? Or, you know, if Iron Man came rocketing down Mass Ave, rattling the windows on the side, what would it be what, it, what would it be like to be standing here and looking at that? Yeah. Um and and uh uh, so I was fascinated with the question of what would it be like to be in that world, to see that sort of thing, much more than what would it be like to to to, to be a superhero. And I would think about stupid stuff like my one of my sisters had a poster of Sean Cassidy, yeah, Leaf Garrett, somebody like that. Yeah. On their bedroom wall, it was one of those, you know, here's a here's a here's a sexy guy with his shirt like open or maybe no shirt at all, and his jeans are unstapped, and he's like, "Whoa, look at me!" Um, and I and I would ask, I would think, what do teenage girls in the Marvel universe have on their walls? You know, they're not going to have a poster of Spider Man because Spider Man's creepy. They're not going to have a poster of Captain America because Captain America wouldn't license that. They're going to have a poster of the Johnny Storm because Johnny would be all over that. Johnny, Johnny would be like, sign me up. You bet. You want me flaming on a little bit? Okay, let's do it. Um, and, and you know, so I'd, I'd, I'd think about stuff like that. And that turned into stories. Like I, I, I did, a, I did an, an, an Iron Man story, a short, like, eight-page Iron Man story. It was about a guy who worked in the motor pool at Stark Industries. And every month he put in an application for transfer. He wanted to be Iron Man. <laughs> I mean, Iron Man is an employee of the company, right? There must be three shifts because he's always on call. There must be weekend guys. And, you know, there's a couple of times Iron Man died and they had a new Iron Man up right away. It's got to be a training program or something. And they'd say, no, 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 no. And, and, uh, uh, so one day he, he ends up, uh, 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 the, there's a problem and somebody's got to drive Tony Stark to some meeting and the, the, the regular guys are all unavailable. So he's got to do it. So he, he drives Tony to his meeting and along the way they're, attra- they're attacked by a supervillain. Um, and the guy is terrified. You know, this is the first time he's seen Iron Man up close because Tony slips away and becomes Iron Man. Yeah. And and uh, um, uh, and, and he beats the villain and, and 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 the guy is like Jesus, I could never do this. And so the next, you know, the, when the next month comes along, he comes back and 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 the 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 um, uh, 
personnel department. I say, are you putting in another application to be Iron Man? He says, no, 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 I, I'm, I'm not qualified for that. And they go, Whoosh. he says, I'm putting in an application for security guard. I want to work my way up. <laughs> and, and that was, you know, that was one of the first stories I told about an ordinary guy in the superhero world. Um, I also did an Avengers story about a, a, a kid who meets the Avengers um, and his older brother turns out to be the head of the local chapter of the Sons of the Serpent. Um, but those were sort of like the, the early stories. Um, the other half of that comes from Alex, because Alex, um, you know, Alex wanted to get into comics. Alex had done the Terminator, the Burning Earth miniseries for, for now comics, I think. And yeah. they, they'd stiffed him on pay, payment. Yep. Um, but because of that, I was working at Marvel and direct sales at the time. And I was editing a series called open space and looking for interesting artists. And, uh, um, uh, Paul Curtis brought Alex's work to my attention. I said, let's find this guy. Let's get him to do a story. He did a story for open space that would have been an open space six if open space hadn't been canceled with issue four. Mm -hmm. um, so, so Alex had broken into comics. One company didn't pay him and the other company didn't publish the story, but did pay him. So a couple of years later, when Alex decided I'm going to take another crack at this, he, he, uh, he contacted me because let's face it, I was the one who paid him. <laughs> uh, uh, I also, you know, I, I was also connected to Marvel. And, and Marvel, you know, he would have much rather worked for Marvel than for now comics. Um, uh, I was no longer on staff at Marvel. I was freelancing. Um, and so over the next, I don't know how long, um, I talked to Alex a lot. I, I showed his samples around. I got him, uh, I got him some work uh, doing a couple of things at Eclipse. Um, and, and... I, you know, he had these, these samples that had all these nice presentation pieces, many of which have been printed, um, uh, now about, uh, uh, Marvel superheroes, the various Marvel superheroes that he thought were, 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 were particularly historically important. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, he had an idea to do an anthology series called Marvel. His idea was get painters to do stories of Marvel superheroes that are in different visual approaches than standard comics approach uh, approaches. And that way he could do a bunch of them featuring the characters he wanted. Um, and I explained to him, you can't sell this, Alex, you're, you're a terrific artist, but if you go in to Marvel and you say, I want you to create a new monthly comic book that I can do some of. And by the way, it's an anthology, which doesn't sell. It's basically Marvel fanfare, but yeah. more expensive to produce because you're going to have to hire painters. Um, and I said, but you could sell it if it was a story, you know, if it was a mini series that you were going to do all of. And, and, and it was, it was, uh, um, uh, it was going to be, something that had a beginning, a middle and an end, maybe if you do that and it works out well, then you can tell them you want to do that anthology and then they'll have a reason to listen to you because you're not nobody anymore. You're not some kid from Chicago who used to work in advertising. Um, at the same time, Eclipse was trying to get uh, Alex to do a story that was a, an adaptation of a Clive Barker story. Um, and I don't think I'm, um, I'm telling tales out of school or anything to say Alex didn't want to do it because Alex thought Clive Barker stuff was growth. Um, so he was sort of putting them off. You know, they wanted him to do a, a detective series about Lovecraft and Howard. I think he even agreed to do that at some point. But while they were trying to get him to do a Clive Barker special and he was resisting, they thought, I know we'll send his work to Clive. And Clive can convince him to do it because he's Clive Barker. He's famous. And so they sent Alex a samples, including, you know, all of these paintings of Marvel superheroes to Clive Barker. And, and 
Barker called Alex up at the advertising agency he worked at, and Alex didn't believe it was him. Alex thought it was one of his friends fucking with him. Um, uh, so, so, but, but they got uh, past that a little. And, and what Barker told Alex was, I am doing this book at Marvel called Hellraiser. And I think you should do stuff for Hellraiser. Hell with these Eclipse guys. Hmm? I have sent your samples to the editor of Hellraiser at Marvel. Um, and the editor of Hellraiser was Mark McLaurin. And Mark looked at Alex's samples and said, absolutely, we want to do something, which is why Alex's first job for Marvel um, is a is a is a like a backup story in an issue of Hellraiser that introduces a new horror superhero team called the Harrowers. Yeah. Um, it is absolutely the sort of stuff that Alex didn't want to do for Eclipse. But for Marvel, you know, that's a way in the door. And Marcus asked Alex, all these paintings of, of, of Marvel superheroes, is that for something? And, and Alex said, well, there's this project that Kurt Busiek and I are talking about. Would you like to see a pitch? And, and Marcus said, absolutely, I'd like to see a pitch. So that was, you know, that was the, now we have an editor interested. We have Alex's work. We have me trying to come up with, you know, ideas that would make use of the historical sweep of characters Alex wanted to use. Because the original Human Torch and the Submariner were on his list, and so was Gwen Stacy. And that means it's got to start in the late 30s, and it's got to end, you know, before Gwen's dead. Although in the end, it, it didn't. It ended after. But but so we put together the project from all of that stuff accreting, and eventually Marvel said, yes, let's do this. Yeah. Um, so you didn't that, actually have a pitch when he said, he said, yes, we can do a pitch. No, no, in fact, I didn't even know that this thing that Alex and I were talking about was something that I would write. Yeah. You know, I was I was the guy who used to do editing up at Marvel and I was giving him advice. You know, hey kid, you want to do this? Hey kid, you're gonna be smart to do that. Um uh, and Alex had somebody else in mind to to write this. Um, but they bailed on it. And they just they just ghosted him at some point. So when when Marcus expressed some interest, Alex said, I've been talking to Kurt Busick because I was a real comic book writer. Right, right. <laughs> um, so then we had to, you know, we had to go back and and actually turn some of the stuff we've been talking about um into a pitch. I mean, it, we came up with really stupid ideas, like one of my stupid ideas was what if there's like a, 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 a weapon, a technological weapon that gets sent back in time from the future, and in the 40s it fights the, the, <laughs> the, the human torch and the submariner, and it learns from this and evolves. So then later it fights the Fantastic Four in the 60s, and it evolves, and it becomes... And it was exactly the sort of thing that in, like, you know, 1988 would have been a, a crossover in, in the annuals. Yeah. Um, it would have been really bad yeah. um uh but uh but at some point you know alex had the idea that maybe this could be seen through a reporter's eyes mm. um but he had never mentioned that to me that was that was the idea he was talking with about the other guy um and i thought alex does these really realistic paintings um and to some degree I was reacting to that, you know, if Bill Sikevich does Daredevil, it's all blurs and 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 motion and and exciting. Um, Alex wants to give you that detail. Alex will freeze the image. Yeah. But freeze the image says photograph. What if it's a photographer? What if some guy is taking pictures? Um, and that turned out to work out really well. Yeah. Um, but I proposed that. So um, uh, I also, my I like to think of this as my big claim to fame. Um, uh, Alex, the Alex's idea for the 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 title for the anthology was Marvel. Yeah. So I added an S. Yeah. 
No, that's 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 genius at work. <laughs> I said, if you add an S, yeah, and it becomes a a, a noun, it's not the company name. It's yeah. what these characters are. Years later, I I told Roy Thomas about you know about this, and Roy said, I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> I would have used that because um, it was it, you know it was a way to say that the Marvel characters are are special in yeah. a way that you know DC characters. They, you can't call them DCs. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, especially but, Detective Comics, you know. Yeah. yeah, but 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 so so uh, so yeah, we 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 developed the idea. You know, we were most of the way there um, uh, when Marcus said he was interested, and we we developed it. We actually, when we first pitched it, it was again, it was an anthology. Um, but it was an anthology with the continuing character of Phil Sheldon. And we made up these stories um, where here's war correspondent Phil Sheldon uh, on duty in, in London meeting up with the Human Torch. And we made up this story about the Human Torch and the invaders that Phil could witness. Um, here in another story is, uh, you know, photojournalist Phil Sheldon being one of the first uh, newsman allowed into Latveria when Latveria was opened up and he got to see uh, the, the Doctor Doom versus the Fantastic Four. Um, we did put in a story where on, on, on trial where the Black Widow was put on trial for the crime of being a Russian because I never let her in. Um, and, and Tom DeFalco said why make stuff up? You know, if this guy is wandering around the Marvel universe witnessing things, why don't you have him witness things that Jeff? At that point, the book because, well, I don't do things halfway. Um, I, I, I said, okay, if that's what we're going to do, then if Phil is reporting on Galactus, then when he's not in the middle of the Galactus stuff, he's be in what else was going on in the Marvel Universe at the time. So what else was going on in the Marvel Universe at the time? I had to read everything, and I had to <laughs> take notes on, on what the public witnessed. What didn't I have a list somewhere of every every New York newspaper name that Stan Lee made up off the top of his head to, to fit into a panel. You know, there's like 60 different, different newspapers that Marvel had in the silver age and the, the bugle and the globe are the two that lasted. Um, but, but he, he, he just made up stuff left and right because it beat remembering what he'd been writing last week. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that, you know, doing that research, I borrowed um, uh, Golden Age comics on microfish from from a, from a friend in Los Angeles, so that I could read, you know, all of the Marvel superhero stories from the '30s and early '40s up until we got to the 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 you know the second Human Torch Submariner clash with the big tidal wave, um, because then I could figure out what else was happening so when we did a one panel cutaway to oh and the human torch was doing this i could refer to something real um and that's where i discovered things like the sentinels had to debut on the same day that reed and sue got married because if they didn't x-men continuity doesn't make any sense it's like in x-men 12 13 the Human Torch guest stars, and there's dialogue that says it's before the wedding, and at thirteen, the the uh, the the end of thirteen, the X Men are all injured, and then fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen are a three part story that starts just as they get out of the hospital, and at the end of it, they're all injured again, um, and seventeen, eighteen is a two parter um, that starts just as as you know they they they're no longer injured, um, so literally. The only point in that stretch of continuity 
that the X-Men were uninjured and could attend the Fantastic Four wedding, which they did, was X-Men 14. They take off the bandages. They say, oh boy, we get to get out of here. We're all going on vacation. And they 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 head out to the city to do stuff and get attacked by the Sentinels. So that's it. There are about four hours in there where they could, you know, they 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 could have attended the wedding. Um, and then they're immediately attacked by the Sentinels. So, you know, I looked at that and said, well, that's so, dramatic so, so, as all hell. <laughs> Is is continuity is continuity a benefit or a handcuff? Well, in that case, it was a huge benefit. Okay, but but in general, I mean, like that sounds like an insane thing to have to try to process and to figure out, like, what four hours could this story happen? You know, well, normally it's not that tight. <laughs> yeah, normally, if 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 the Human Torch hadn't guest starred in the Juggernaut story in X Men then it could have happened at any time but by by sheer chance you know they'd thrown the human torch into this story because x-men wasn't selling as well as they'd like um and they thought maybe this could boost it um and then the human torch talks about how his sister's about to get married because because stan's cross promoting right 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 uh, if not for that um, then it's just like, oh, okay, it just, it just, it happened before that fight. Um, yeah. uh, and, and in most cases, continuity doesn't fit together like that. But I yeah. knew we had to do the Sentinels because that's this big public mutant thing. And we're going to introduce the, I, the whole mutant issues idea in the story. Yeah. And yeah. I knew we were going to do the Fantastic Four wedding because for Christ's sake, it's a big celebrity event. Um, yeah. So if you're seeing what happened in public, both of those had to be there. Um, in general, I think continuity is, um, it's a positive because it's, 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 you know, nobody goes and writes World War II novels and goes, God damn, I wish, I, I wish Dwight D. Eisenhower wasn't doing that at this point. Dwight D. Eisenhower was doing that at this point. If you're writing historical novels, you make it fit together. You know, you can screw around with stuff that nobody cares about, and you can do that in comics too. Um, but but if you're writing a historical novel, you get the history right. And yeah. Marvels is a historical novel set in the Marvel universe. Absolutely. And it's I, I guess I guess more broadly though, what I'd ask, and and I, I'm sure you're facing this today with the 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 the, antho the current title the marvel the marvels that yes i added an s had, to it and then i put the, it. you added a the very good yeah um, exactly um uh so so but i guess my question is 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 it, it, it historical fiction is a thing right and that and that's a thing that works because it happened at a time and a place but now continuity is no longer fixed in time, right? So, so Reed wasn't in World War II anymore because it wouldn't possibly work anymore. At this point, they were in Desert Storm, which like doesn't really make sense. Like, if you start trying, like, so at what point does continuity become a trap? Like, is it um, should should the universes have evolved past uh, where they are? Am I? I don't know that I'm asking a, an actual cogent well, question. Well, the thing is, you know, continuity works different ways. You know, I I like to think of it as fictional history because continuity sounds like, oh well, you know, this is something to be fussy and nerdy about, but but history, well, you know, that's that's just the history of the character. Um, and there's been a lot, you know, now the Marvel Universe, you know, not just going from 1939, but going from 1961 with the Fantastic Four. Yeah. That's that's 60 years. Yep. That's a long time. A long I, I time. Was, I was excited when I was, um, uh, when I was uh, you know, 14 years old. 
to read a daredevil story where something that happened four years ago mattered. Yeah. Four years ago at that time was a significant chunk yeah. of Marvel history. Yeah. And um, a significant chunk of your life as a reader at that point. Well, my life as a reader at that point was weak. Um, uh, no, no, but that's what I'm saying. Like it, it was, it was within your time. What Ed, go on? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I if the millionaire picked up that back issue, um, it could have been there for 80s. Um, but nowadays, you know, I was too, too day back to Dare 120 which came out in 1974. Well, that's 46 years, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, that would be the equivalent of me picking up Daredevil 120 uh, in 1975 and having it make reference to what was 46 years before 1975. Um, 1829? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Or 19, maybe, but one or yeah. the other, yeah. Marvel didn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. that, 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 that uh, Gasoline Alley had just started. Right. Um, so nowadays, the, the stretch of all that time is just, is just huge. But yeah. still, there are, there are some rules you can look at, and there are different ways you can approach it. Um, you know, it was never the case where where you'd say, well, you know, Reed was in World War II, so he's got to stay in World War II. Um, it was in the early 70s at some point that, that you know, um, uh, they made some reference uh, to the girl Reed left behind when he went off to war. And she was like, oh, it must have been some other girl because you were in World War II. And he said, no, no, we're talking about Korea. And of course, you know, that doesn't work anymore. But no. but, but that that part, you know, once they started making Marvel time flexible at all, real world references were, were, were flexible. Um, that, that the, you know, the Fantastic Four met John F. Kennedy. They met Lyndon Johnson, they met Richard Nixon, they met, you know, but if you flash back to those stories today, they met the president. Sure. You know, sure. but, but, yeah. but like, I, I would think that it's a, not a, no, it is essential to the Fantastic Four's origin that they're early pioneers of space. Right. And so I, that immediately ties them to an era uh, and a time. I'm not sure it is. Um, but again, you know, there are different ways to, to handle this. But but these days, you know, the, the, the Fantastic Force origin is about a brilliant guy who builds a rocket and goes into space and something goes wrong and they end up with superpowers. So if you were telling that story today for a movie, well, there are people who are trying to do commercial space flight right now. I suppose, yeah. So, so you can just sort of say, well, they're not trying to beat the Russians to the moon. I mean, even, even at the point that you know, while Jack Kirby was still drawing uh, Fantastic Four, we landed on the moon, and the Fantastic Four did a story about the race to land on the moon. Yeah, they'd already been there multiple times. <laughs> there was a guy with a condo on the moon, you know. There, there was. There was, uh, you know, it, but, but they, I shouldn't have laughed that hard. That they, was a good one. He didn't do a story where Reed goes, ha ha, look, Neil Armstrong, ha ha, that asshole. Um, they, 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 they treated it as if it was important because, no. okay, we're not going to talk about that stuff anymore. Yeah. If at that point, they had retold the Fantastic Four's origin. They might have just been trying to, you know, orbit the planet or something. Right. Um, uh, they, 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 they'd fit it as a reaction to what was going on. Yeah. Um, so that sort of stuff is, is flexible. What we did in Marvels was, you know, Alex felt very strongly that he didn't want to say, 
well, this stuff is happening 10 years ago. Because if it's happening 10 years ago in 1994, that's 1984. Yeah. And in 1984, the world was very different and it looked very different than it did in 1961. Yeah. Um, and as he pointed out, and this was this was a very, very sensible argument, whatever he painted was going to get dated. If he if we showed the Fantastic Four origin, not that we showed that in, in Marvels, but if we showed that happening 10 years ago in 1984, then 10 years later, those scenes would look wrong. Sure. Because that wouldn't be 10 years ago anymore. But they would look wrong in a way that looked different from when you go back and look at the actual original stories. So he said, if we make it look like the original stories, then it will still date, but it'll have the same aesthetic as yeah. when you go back and look at those 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 original stories. It will look wrong in a different way. It'll look wrong in the same way. Yeah. Um, so that was why, other than in in Marvel in Marvels one, the we never say what year it is. You know, we don't specify that. It looks like the sixties, the early seventies, whatever. You could assume that there's a you know there's a classic car rally going on right at that moment, and right. that's why all the cars in the background are are, are classics. Nice. Um, we left it deniable, kind of like when in the in the in the first story we had J, young Jana jo, jo, young J Jonah Jameson as a character, and the Spider Man editor said J Jonah Jameson isn't old enough to have been uh, a, a, a young man in World War II. And we said, of course he was. You know, there was some story done somewhere that said that he was retirement age, and if he was retirement age a few years ago, then then that would make him, you know, call him 68 in, in 1974. Then he was born before 1910. He was born in 1906 yeah. in order to be that age. And that means that come World War II, he's in his 30s. Yeah. So screw that. We won't say he's in his 30s. We'll just treat him like he's 22. And they said, no, 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 no. He's he's not that old. Um, and 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 you have to fix this. And it's just like the whole issue is painted, man. So we just, <laughs> uh, you know, it wasn't something where you could have John Romita come in and, 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 and look like somebody else. This this was Alex Ross painting. So yeah. and and we didn't want to do that anyway. So we just said okay, all the parts where they actually use his name, we'll leave it out and we'll have him talk about how he's going to run the bugle someday. And everybody will know it's J. Jonah Jameson, but the Spider-Man editor can say, no, 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 that's not him. You know, there's nothing in the story that says it's him. Right. So everybody who wants to say it's him can say, yeah, okay, I get it. And everybody who doesn't want to can say, can't possibly be. And 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 you you can both be right, hmm. and that's one way to approach, you know, the continuity. Stick so, with so it's, it's sort of the Schrodinger's cat theory of continuity. Right, right. Don't you know? Make it look like what it used to look like, but right. don't you know? Don't nail it. Don't show nail it. Yeah, mm -hmm. John F. Kennedy as the yeah. president and say President Kennedy because yeah. then you've nailed it down. Yeah. Uh, uh, the other, you know, the, the 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 second way I ended up doing this was when I did Untold Tales of Spider Man, and we wanted to do a similar sort of. We don't want to deny, um, uh, deny things, and we don't want to confirm things. So I made sure to plot stories that didn't need any cell phones. And 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 uh, Pat Olaf softened the hairstyles. So he made it look like I could believe that was 10 years ago. It's a little odd for 10 years ago, but it, it doesn't contradict being 10 years ago. 
But at the same time, if you read it next to a Steve Ditko issue of Spider-Man, it doesn't feel out of place. We wanted to give it a a a, a, um, a context where whichever way you wanted to see Marvel continuity, you could see it in that. And now I'm doing the Marvels in which in which we're specifically saying, no, it was 10 years ago. It was 14 years ago. It was, you know, we want to make it feel like maybe the sort of thing you might see in one of the, the Marvel movies. Right. Um, we want it to feel like this is, this is, this is modern, um, that this is not a, a, uh, 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 this sort of out of time Peter Pan thing. Um, and I find it interesting that, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting to treat continuity every, every possible way. <laughs> um, you know, I even did this Submariner story that I just recently did, um, that was set mostly in the, uh, uh, in the, in the early 1930s when the Submariner was a teenager, mm -hmm. um, and, and stuff that I would have never dared to do 20 years ago. I got to say, oh yeah. And Lady Dur Dorma was lear learning sorcery. Well, so none of that was referenced later. Yeah. They just didn't talk about it. Huh? She, she, she had this weird Kirby-esque pet fish with powers it's just well why didn't we see him later i don't know he's off cavorting in space with crypto <laughs> this is gonna be fun for this story the the number of people who are gonna say well why didn't lady Murphy ever refer to having sorceress skills in later years there's seven of them and they're all happy to see lady dorma again so they're not going to go, no, oh, Kurt, you can do that. They're going to yeah. go, it's Lady Dorma. I'm yeah. so happy to see her. I don't care. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, we, we could have put in a bit that her duties as a lady of the Atlantean court made it difficult for her to, you know, so, so she put that stuff aside. But screw it. You know, we did it because it would be fun. So, so you know, continuity, history, is a is a is a flexible thing um and when it's valuable as in marvels um go with it and yeah. when it isn't dance around it you it's almost cool. never really have to outright contradict it except for stuff like you know captain america met lyndon johnson right you know, that 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 doesn't work anymore, but but you can have, say, Captain America met with the president. Um, but other than that sort of thing, other than things like, you know, Peter Parker. I feel, like, I feel like Captain America and Ronald Reagan is and is like an actual major thing, though. There was a point where Captain America, Ronald Reagan. I don't think he was ever identified as Ronald Reagan in his face. Well, I guess so. Yeah, maybe he was all in shadows. Yeah. Yeah. He turned into a snake. Yeah, he did uh, turn into a snake. No, I know. I remember. I, I remember I, vividly. I, I, I what I what I what I like about that story is it's set in Washington D.C. and the Servant Society has put a serum in the water that'll turn everybody into snakes. But but the story they didn't tell you was that a week before that, some other supervillain came by and put a serum in the in the water that turned everybody into white people. Because it's Washington D.C. and they're all white, <laughs> so uh, there's some sort of fictional history, you know. Or they were the. <laughs> That's really good. My uh, so so my uh, uh, I actually saw part of Marvels before it even saw print. My this is my story that. I was in, it was probably six months before it was solicited. Uh, and I was in New York for some reason, probably visiting my mom or something. I don't know. Um, and I happened to go by the Marvel offices. I was, I was probably the fifth or sixth year of owning a comic shop at that point. Uh, and I was visiting Lou Bank and Lou Bank's like, dude, you have to see this. And he, he brought me over to the file cabinets they had, you know, which were those like pull out file cabinets because yeah. all the original art was put in flat files. I'm yes. just saying this so that so that like kids today those understand that this was actually files. printed on I mean there was drawn on boards. It was the the original art is a real solid thing. It 
was so digital back then. Anyway, uh, and so he pulls out these pages, uh, and it was I saw maybe six or seven pages from it, and my uh, my jaw dropped. I was just like, "What the fuck is this? This is this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen." Uh, and I don't even know that he that we that they told me the title maybe or that I I know they didn't know when it was coming out because it was that early in the process. So it might have even been more than six months. I don't know. Um, uh, so, but when did you know that you had something here that was different than other things? Yeah. We, we knew it was different right from the start because we, we set out to be different. Okay. What we had no idea of was that it was going to be popular. Right. We were, you know, we were, I, I don't want to speak for Alex at this late date, but I at least thought that issue two might sell okay because it had the x-men in it even if it was you know the wrong x-men <laughs> yeah but but selling the book to marvel selling the, the 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 pitch was was difficult you know they were interested in it they liked the art they liked the idea but we went through like three four rounds of pitching and and we kept getting the you know one of the pieces of response we got consistently was drop this world war ii stuff nobody cares about world war ii and we would rewrite the pitch and fix all the other stuff that they you know that they that, that they had concerns with and we'd still start it with the human torch and the submariner because it's the freaking marvel universe it starts right. the human torch and the submariner it has yep. to be there and now you look at it and go of course it has to be there but at the time there were people at Marvel who were very much, this is a sales, this is going to be a disaster because you're starting off with World War II stuff. You know, is, a, is there a way you can start with modern stuff and cut back to World War II if you have to do World War II? And we just kept saying, no, it has to start this way, which was, you know, uh, Alex was very firm on it. And Alex was at this point, you know, he had no profile whatsoever. A talented artist but 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 he had no he had no weight to throw around yeah i had even less because i was a guy who had been working in the industry for like 11 years at that point and i never had a breakout anything so so but still we just kept you know we said no it has to start here and we kept uh modifying the the, the pitches until until they finally said well okay but that led us going into it thinking you know, this is going to be a cute side project. This is going to be something that that some people will like, but it's 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 about a little old Jewish guy who wanders around the Marvel universe, going, "Whoa, look at that!" That doesn't sound commercial. We had no idea how to pitch it, how to how to how to sell it. You should have actually sold it like that. Well, we can do that now. But <laughs> it's an old Jewish guy walking around the Marvel Universe, going, "Oh, look but, at that!" But yeah. you no, know, going back to to to, to, to 1994, we're talking yeah. about the height, yeah, of the popularity of McFarland, yeah, Leifeld and Jim Lee, and all like yeah. doodly little scratchy and like not and we're, not we're, this, we're, not this. We're doing realistic looking yep. stories about yep. an ordinary guy. And we couldn't, I mean, it wasn't until I think somebody was doing a sell sheet for 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 the book like two weeks before it came out, or maybe it was even for for the trade paperback or something. But we came up with the tagline, the Marvel Universe through a whole new perspective. Yours. And I just thought, where was that when we were soliciting number one? Yeah. Because the general idea when we were soliciting number one, people thought that what it was going to be was it was retellings of moments from Marvel history with nice art. Right. The idea that it was this this sort of striking new perspective on the human experience in a world of superheroes, we didn't have the 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 we didn't have the words yeah to describe that so we were just 
working away, doing this story, this story that we thought was going to be, you know, a blip. But I was hungry, you know, I'd do whatever. Um, and Alex, you know, wanted to break in. He wanted to show what he could do. Um, it wasn't until we found out that uh, Terry Stewart, the president of the company, was hand selling this book at conventions. He was he he didn't know how to describe it either, but he was calling people over and saying, "Look at this, look at this art, look how cool this is." Um, and he's the president of the company, and he 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 was you know he was reacting like that to to the material. We did not know that when new pages came in from Alex, everybody went over to Mark McLaren's office to look at it. Yeah. That, you know, I was I was out here in the Pacific Northwest. Alex was in Chicago. We didn't see any of that. Yeah. So we just thought it's going to be a thing. But the point where we, we found out, you know, the company president yeah. taking time out of his day to say, dude, look at this. Yeah. Then we thought, well, maybe... Um, and then the first issue came out and the first issue came out and they had printed, I don't know how many copies for the, uh, for the direct market. And they printed more for not exactly newsstand, but it was newsstand venues like blister packs at yep. Disney world, things like that. And they had to steal all the books from Disney world. So that they could sell them into uh, into the direct market. Yeah. Um, going in, I thought that issue two was going to be the best selling issue because it had X Men in the cover. Issue two was, in fact, the worst selling issue because um, uh, issue one ordered in okay because it was an issue one. It was the early nineties. Issue two, there was a drop off. By the time issue three came out, people had seen issue one, and issue three sold better than issue two and issue four sold better than issue one yeah um uh because they you know they 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 got to react to it um but literally i i did a, like a store signing for issue one petersburg maryland where a friend of mine lawrence watt evans was a uh, uh investor in the local comic book store um and and after the signing which which went which went well you know it was it was nice we went back to his house and he showed me usenet oh uh, this was before the internet yes. was was yes. ubiquitous but usenet blew up usenet was like what the hell is this book um and and uh uh so you know i got to see the reaction of people in a store and then i got to see uh, online reaction back before online reaction was 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 a particularly big thing um at the time alex was still working on issue four so so issue four was the only issue that was done at a time when we knew this is a hit so uh, but at some point but at some point the, you particularly because you had been in sales and, and I want to talk about that as well, but let's, let's not sidetrack myself. Um, uh, the fact that Marvel put this, the original serialization in an upscale format, uh, uh, cardstock covers, it had that wraparound acetate cover, right? Which was freaky and weird. And, and, you know, clearly somebody had some, some enthusiasm for this. Yes, but, um, I mean, we pitched it as 448 page things because that was the Dark Knight. Right. You know, we thought we needed the room. We thought it was, you know, it, 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 it clearly wasn't something that was going to be a comic book like Spider-Man. Yeah. Wait. So let me pin that. Let me pin that there for one second. Did you did you at any point actually think that it was like Dark Knight? Only in format. I mean, ba back then. Okay, so, but, so you didn't you didn't think that it was like gonna change things? No, no, no. The, okay. The, okay. I just li literally people in the in the in 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 business in virtually any business 
will find the stupidest things to get excited about when something is a hit. And with Dark Knight, there was a long stretch after it that was, wow, people really like square bound comics. Don't right, you? exactly. Yeah, no, no, I remember. I remember in the worst <laughs> comics were being put out in that format and nobody bought them uh, because the comic, the underlying work wasn't any good. But but Marvel's was originally going to be four forty eight page issues because they were still saying miniseries can be done like Dark Knight. Right. That was you know Square Bound was popular. It didn't end up Square Bound, but the reason it didn't end up Square Bound was because I was briefly smart, and <laughs> I had heard. That there was a there was a Luke Cage series that that Mark McLaurin wrote, and it was supposed to have an acetate wraparound cover. You know, this was also the era of schmancy covers. Yes, um, and it was supposed you know it was supposed to have an acetate cover, but they couldn't do you know for some reason the technology of it did not work at that point um and i heard through somebody that that technology aspect had been solved it was now possible to do an acetate wrapper on cover and i thought i want me one of those you know i want to try to make this book sell because we've got so much lined up against us we've got world war ii we've got the wrong x-men we've got you know they keep trying to get us to put wolverine in an issue and we keep saying no um uh so i wanted some sort of advantage um and i i suggested to marcus i hear that the acetate cover thing is a thing that could be done now and i figured marcus would get excited about that because that was something that he was going to get and then didn't and now he could get it for, for a book he was editing. Um, and it turned out they couldn't do an acetate cover on a square bound book. Mm. Um, they could like a year later. And, and, and they did some books like that. But right at that point, they hadn't solved that yet. But I had, I had sold them on the idea that this is like stepping into the Marvel Universe. So if we have this acetate cover that's got the logo and the issue number and the price and all on it. And you just open that cover and you just take it away all the trade dress. And it's like, you're stepping into this realistic world of Alex's cover. Then it particularly suits our book. Um, and that was convincing enough. So they said, okay, we won't do it in dark night for a minute. That was literally, you know, eventually it got called prestige format. And so yeah. but it was just called, dark night format for a while um uh we'll do it side stapled um uh because this 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 gimmick um uh is particularly suited to this book um and i should apologize to everybody who bought it back then i had it a dollar to the price of every single issue right and i, and I appreciate all you guys for buying it because the royalties on that were enough for me to launch Astro City. Nice. So, <laughs> no, so, we all win then. No, we all win. No, it's, it's paying it forward, right? Like you're buying into into the future at that point. I mean, I feel good as a, both a retailer and a consumer doing that. You know, but, uh, uh, but, and I think, yeah, that's, that's I, think where it I think it's it's one of those kind of really rare mm -hmm. cases of um, of of form uh, pushing content, right? Like I don't know that I can point to a lot of examples in comics where like your idea there sold more copies of the book because the book was good, right? Like if the book had been shitty, it wouldn't have made any difference. But Ooh. but because the book was good, it stood out on the rack in a way very different than anything else on the shelf. I mean, much, much like the same way the Dark Knight was was stood out for being a prestige format book when there was not such a thing then. You yeah, I, I, I heard from a lot of people who picked up Marvels and looked at it because it had these weird shiny covers. Yeah. And and the covers got them to take it down from the rack 
and they opened it up and they looked at the art and they said, this is beautiful. Yep. And they bought it and they took it home and they read it and reading it makes them say, and I'm getting next issue too. Yep. So, so, you know, marketing wise, we, we, we didn't know what we were doing, but we did everything right. Um, uh, Alex was the, the, the upfront draw, Alex, you know, and the Marvel heroes, of course. Um, but, but you could look at the art and go, this is really pretty. I want to try it. Um, and yeah. then the story was enough to say, and I want more of this. Yeah. Um, uh, but apparently, uh, the fact that it had shiny plastic covers and you could use it as a coaster, um, uh, was, uh, uh, was something that made people actually uh, take it down from the shelf and look at the art and see yeah. that that gorgeous cover was not just a gorgeous cover, that the whole freaking issue looked like that. Right. Yeah, um, I mean, so, it, it's still like I mean, it still probably would have gone on to be as successful as it was without those acetate covers. But I, I do think that it it actually worked to do the thing that you were trying to achieve. You know? I think I think that if it not for the acetate covers, you know, it would certainly it would still be in print today. We'd still be doing, you know, celebrations of it and so forth because because the content was was good. You know, the yeah. the that that. Alex and I put together a good book, yeah. um, but um, you know we might have been looking at you know two thirds of the sales, yeah, um, uh, uh, and and those you know and those numbers would have been made up eventually in trade paperback and hardcover form. Yeah, um, and I remember, I remember too. There was a little bit of a frenzy, right? Because because of the acetate cover, it couldn't be reprinted instantly the way that a normal comic could be. Like it added, I want to say, another month to when it it the the next printing came out. I don't think they ever reprinted it. Did I mean, they, certainly, it, you know, a year later they did it without acetate covers. Oh, okay, maybe that's what I'm thinking about. And and, and they did, you know, they did the 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 trade paperback back then. You know they. We, we the, the 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 first hardcover was done by graffiti editions yep. and it was literally signatures done for the uh printed for the for the periodicals glued together sewed together i guess um uh and it wasn't until you know the next version of the book that they actually did introductions and stuff, right. stuff that required new printing right. um as that that first graffiti edition is literally the four comics without covers stuck together in in, in a book um i also want to point out we, we we talked earlier about how alex's original pitch for this was it was an anthology um and you know last year alex got to do that anthology um, and it got to be called Marvel. Um, so I was right, you know, admittedly it took many, many years, but I was right that if that first project worked, he'd get to do the anthology he wanted to do. It first. <laughs> um, but <laughs> um, the, one of the, the, the um, uh, one of the acts of the series that reflects the fact that it started out as an anthology is what you're holding there in your hand you think of as a graphic novel. It's four single issue stories. That's how I think of it. It's it's just we 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 pitched it as a multi-story anthology first and then we stripped it down and we combined things so forth. but each issue, you know, people people would come up to me and say, "Mr. President, sir." No, no, people people would come up to me and and and, and tell me Man, I saved all four issues. You know, I saved all four issues so that I could read it all at once. And I said, it's four single issue stories. You know, they did the same thing with Superman's Secret Identity. They said, I, I knew this was going to be great, so I waited until I had the whole thing. And I said, every issue is a self-contained story. It, it's, it's, it's it, you know, you, you didn't need to wait. There were no cliffhangers. <laughs> no, there. Yeah. There, there, there was literally, you know, every issue starts with a new introduction that tells you 
what's going on in the Marvel universe now, you know, here's Phil, he's a reporter. You, you can, you can separate them out and, and they all work on their own. Okay. Um, but, but that is very likely, um, a, a follow on from the fact that we, we started, uh, with the idea of an anthology. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I, I think it works because of that. Um, I want to ask you, I want to ask you a little bit about your time in the direct sales department uh, at Marvel, which was, what what years were that? Was that nineteen eighty eight through nineteen ninety? Okay, so so that was a pretty tumultuous time, yeah. yeah it was. It was. Yeah. Um, I had worked at Marvel and sort of not quite in sales before that. That in uh, nineteen eighty three through I think early 1985, I, I was the assistant editor on Marvel Age magazine. So that was about selling the books, doing promotional stuff. Um, but um, I had been working as a literary agent between those two. Um, and I actually, uh, with Carol Kalish, who was the head of the direct sales department, we put together, as I mentioned earlier, a comic called Open Space. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of open space was it was it, it was a science fiction shared universe anthology written by professional established science fiction writers um, with with art, you know, in comics for with art by, by by comics artists. Carol's idea there was, you know, that would be something we could put in bookstores and, and, and use to get fans of science fiction who didn't read comics to start reading comics. And if they started reading comics, we could pull them over to the other books. Um, uh, and it didn't work. Um, it didn't work because we did it, you know, it was a periodical. Um, and the science fiction buyer at Walden Books and the science fiction buyer at B. Dalton, they were really, really interested in this book. But because it was a periodical, they couldn't buy it. The periodical buyer had to buy it. Right. So the periodical buyer wasn't interested. Um, so I think we ended up only in Walden books um, and the sales were terrible. And that's why the book died with issue four. But while I was a literary agent, um, I simultaneously made the, the deal with various of the writers we used and wrote the Bible for, 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 for the series in the first place. Um, and then Carol hired me away from the literary agency to come over to the direct, you know, to the direct sales department. Um, because you know, she, they, she needed somebody there, but she also needed somebody to be the editor of this book that she was now producing. Um, and so for, for, for my time there, I was simultaneously the editor of Open Space and uh, the the um, uh, the, the uh, direct sales uh, direct sales assistant direct sales manager yeah something like that. Um, yeah, Carol was a real visionary, though. I mean, Carol, uh, I, I Carol brought cash registers to comic shops, which I know, like people today will say oh, that that sounds insane. But, yes. but back in those days, most comic book shops were literally run out of cigar boxes. I'm, yes. I'm not kidding. It was, I know you're not kidding. Uh, yeah. It's the way that it was. And, and you know, that Carol thought enough of the market and what the market's potential was. I, I, I just, I wonder if you have any stories to sort of share about that. Because, you know, this is a period of history where, where, I was a, a you know a, a young callow idiot who was trying to open a store and I didn't know what I was doing and I certainly didn't have any sense of what was going on backstage. You know, now I know all kinds of stories, but then I, I'm I'm fascinated by this period. The the eighties were crazy because when it came to the direct market, we were making it up as we went along. Um, people think of the seventies as when you know that was when the direct market started. Um, but in 1982, when I started at Marvel, started selling comics at, yeah. at, at, at selling scripts at Marvel in DC, I started two months after Carol started at Marvel. The direct market was at the, at that time, 15% of Marvel's periodical sales. In 1990, when I left Marvel, it was 85% of their periodical sales. Wow. 
So it was a huge, huge period of growth. But it was a period of growth because, in part, there were things we could do like, yeah, let's get them cash registers at cost because then they'll be able to actually track their sales and see what's what's selling. Yeah. Um, I did stuff. I mean, when I was putting together the 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 Marvel uh the Marvel order form every month, I I came up with a great idea. Let's call it the Marvel catalog. Yeah. And let's call the order form the order form. When I started, it was called the Marvel order form and the actual ordering form was called the ordering form. <laughs> distinguish it from the order form. And 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 my particular genius was to say, it's a freaking catalog. Let's call it a catalog. That way we don't have to do this stupid dance when we say order form. And you have to tell people, well, no, I don't mean that order form. I mean this order form. Shortly after I left Marvel, they changed the 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 title of the catalog to Sales to Astonish. Yeah. They started trying to make it collectible. And it was just like, no, it's a catalog. <laughs> Call it the catalog. Let it be all about doing the job it's supposed to do. Yeah. But yeah, when you say, you know, Carol was a visionary, Carol came up with things like she wanted Marvel to do uh, comic books that were Civil War uh, history, you know, about battles that could be sold at Civil War parks. Um, she was the one who started the the deal with Harlequin, where Marvel was going to do romance comics that Harlequin would uh, would would distribute. And they ended up. I don't think they ever ended up happening because the comics were terrible. Um, Marvel kind of said, "Oh, here's this thing Carol Kalish wants to do: romance comics. Ooh, we all hate romance comics. Let's assign all these romance com comics to all the girls." And let's have Vinnie Coletta ink them all. And they were written by people who didn't want to be writing romance comics. And they were drawn by people who didn't want to be drawing romance comics. Because the women who were working for Marvel at that time were working for Marvel because they liked superheroes. Right. Um, and, you know, Vinnie Coletta made it all look like it was 1965. Um, and Harlequin looked at the books and said, these are crap and we're not going to produce them. And pretty much the people in charge of them and Marvel probably went, we don't have to do that anymore because they didn't want to do it in the first place. Um, but the idea of using romance comics to reach out to the single largest dedicated yeah. audience of readers in, 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 in publishing yeah. was a great idea. Yeah. Carol was if smart. There had been, if there had been somebody who wanted to do it well. Yeah. You know, Carol put together the deal that ended up in that with that uh, Christian superhero comic that Marvel did because she wanted to get into Christian bookstores. Um, she wanted to say, there's an audience. Let's go get them. We will get them. We will bring them back. And and and, and we will we will sell them. You know, we will sell them comics. Yeah. And we'll sell them the kind of comics that they like until they just like comics and then we'll sell them other kinds of comics too which is which is a brilliant way to approach it um huh. it just took 40 years for the market to figure it out <laughs> yeah yeah that 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 there was you know if if marvel had done the sort of thing that like they did when they did star comics where they went off and hired sid jacobson who was a harvey editor yeah, said you do our line instead of like handing the kids line to Ralph Macchio and said make books you hate Ralph <laughs> <laughs> then you know Sid for for you know for good or ill Sid knew what he was doing and he made the kind of books that people envisioned for when Star Comics happened if they'd gone, been able to go out and find somebody who knew how to put together a romance comic and actually wanted to put together good romance comics that could possibly have worked. Um, but, but, you know, if you try 17 things and only three of them work, great. You've got three things that work.
come up with 17 more, please. We'd like another three that work. Yep. Yeah, no, it feels like uh, it feels like the market in, in general, I did, not specifically Marvel, but the market in general has kind of lost that um, uh, experimentation and uh, and trying to find a new audience. Uh, I think I think it's 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 weird. Comic books go through phases of this. Um, it, it, one of the things about the eighties that, that bugged me immensely was that we came up with, you know, that was the era that we started being gardeners. We have this universe. We have to tend to the universe. Mm. How can we, and, and there were good things that came out of doing that. Like the Marvel handbook was a huge success, but but the, you know, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles came along and they were a huge hit. And Marvel and DC went, oh, we don't want to do that. That's not part of our garden. And, and, and Marvel, you know, ultimately did the power package. Yeah. It was, you know, and DC, DC came up with, you know, Keith Giffen, genius, did an ambush bug story. And he did one page of Turtles parody called The Big Fat Freaking Frogs. And Jesus, DC should have done a Big Fat Freaking Frogs comic because it doesn't have the same rhythm as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So it doesn't feel like one of those half-assed parodies like the adolescent radioactive black belt hamsters or whatever else. Um, but it did feel a little gross, the sort of thing your parents wouldn't approve of. You know, that could have been a million dollar franchise. And instead it was one gag page that that uh, uh, that Keith Giffen tossed off uh, while 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 telling some other story. But but back in the 60s, you know, if if James Bond and the man from uncle were hot, look, Nick Fury, agent of shield, let's jump on this acronym spy agency thing. Yeah. Um, uh, back in the back in the 50s. Lassie and Rin Tin Tin were hot. So we got Crypto and we got Ace the Bat Hound. And before that, we got Rex the Wonder Dog. Because it used to be that the comic book industry would say, what's popular out there and how can I get a piece of that? And, and I, I, I think in the 80s, we did a lot of what's, you know, that's popular. Sorry, that's not our thing. Um, I think that when Pokemon was huge, if Stan Lee, you know, at the age he was in the 60s, was was running Marvel, you know, Spider-Man with three months later would have a villain named Monsterosa. Sure. And sure. he'd be a guy who goes around the world trapping Kirby monsters and using them to rob banks. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was the 80s that gave us DC Comics. They're not for kids anymore. You know? Yes. Right? Like this was this was this was the way uh, we thought at the time. We have to be serious. We have to be like everybody has to respect this. They have to be graphic novels. They're graphic novels. You know, I it's it's funny. I think I, I think that you know. I, I was just talking to somebody about this on uh, on Twitter last night. I think it was just we were talking about Vertigo and and the the, the decline and disappearance of Vertigo. And I, I, I made the argument that that comics need, you know, a comics line needs core titles and it needs satellite titles. Yes. The core titles are, you know, the stuff that you can depend on to 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 do the, the basic job every month. And the and the satellite titles are the stuff you experiment with. Um and and the stuff you experiment with is where the new hits are going to come from. Yeah. But those core titles are what's going to keep the doors open week after week, month after month. Um, and I think too often in the comics industry of late, um, we have focused on let's do the cool experimental stuff and let's make that cool experimental stuff happen in Amazing Spider-Man or some other book. Um, and it's just like, no, no, that's supposed to be one of the core, you know, that's the meat and potatoes book. 
that's the book that you want to be able to depend on selling to the younger end of your crowd so that they can become devoted fans and buy the fancy, you know, miniseries stuff that will create the next generation of people. Yes. Um, if you sacrifice your core titles in order to do uh, the cool satellite stuff, you don't have that feeder market to bring in readers for the satellite stuff. Yep. Yeah, I Joe, think- Marvel, Marvel and DC have really kind of given up on uh, proper brand management, and and uh, and it's more about exploiting the IP. I mean, I get it because because it's now multinational corporations who are in charge, you know, and and what they say goes. But it it frustrates me deeply as a retailer. I mean, I get a benefit out of it, right? You know, Vision and Scarlet Witch becomes a television show. We suddenly sell a lot of fucking Vision and Scarlet Witch comics, right? But but I I just I feel like the thing has been lost that was very special that um that i don't know that they realize what they've lost i i have at times been been thinking you know i i want to do a good solid superhero book i mean yeah. right now i'm doing the marvels which is kind of an oddity um and i'll be doing more astro city which is again it's something for people who already like superheroes largely yeah. um uh but but you know to do a good solid month to month adventure superhero comic the question that i always come back to is do you do, do, does anybody know how to sell it because i know that if i do something like Marvels or Superman Secret Identity or Batman Creature of the Night, something that feels kind of novelistic, then the market knows how to sell that. Um, but just the 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 month to month exciting adventures of whether it's a superhero or a spy or, or or you know some sort of action adventure thing, um, if it's a new character it's very, very hard to figure out how to sell those books. Um, and if it's an existing character, then oftentimes it's like, let's do something weird and different that breaks the mold because that's how we can sell to the audience that we're reaching. But how do you reach out to the audience that would like the 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 foundational functional stuff that made everybody who likes the new stuff now like the stuff they liked in the first place that would bring them in. Um, and we have an industry where, you know, we have so many different kinds of comics for so many different people that, that, you know, particularly in a store like yours, yeah. you, you have, an educated audience, a sophisticated audience that is going to be able to start with non-beginner material. Um, but but where's the bridge? Yeah, from, you from... also you can't give people Dark Knight as their first comic, right? Like you, you know, it's it's not the place to. Uh, you can to... if you're twenty. You well, know, maybe you can if they're sixteen, but right, but but. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, Raina Telgemeier is out there making comics for lots and lots and lots and lots of people. Who is out there saying, here's the next step? You know, thank you, Raina. <laughs> here's all the money. <laughs> but now that you've gathered these people, Here's what we give them next, and here's what we give them next. And there are companies doing that, but I don't think Marvel and DC are. No, Marvel and DC aren't. And in fact, I mean, I to the point that Marvel has, it looks like, is outsourcing that to Scholastic at this point. You know, uh, there's the Miles Morales comic, and there's a bunch of other graphic novels that, that Scholastic's doing for so that audience. And Is that IDW or? 
No, no, uh, uh, they're doing it through Scholastic. Through okay. the, not, yeah. It's not a bad. No, it's a know. good, it's a great partnership. It's a perfect yeah. partnership, but right. it's, right. but Scholastic to me, to to me it's, it's an admission of failure to me, right? Like that we don't understand how to do anything other than the thing that we do. And if the thing that you do becomes less relevant, then, then where are you? You know, like I, I, so I wonder, I want to me, I wonder is the Marvel universe, the comics anymore, or is the Marvel universe, the movies, or I mean, maybe it doesn't matter. Right. But I, I think that the fan experience and the fan expectation has maybe changed. Um, I don't know, bigger, bigger thoughts than you probably want to talk about. I don't know. Yeah. Also, you know, it's just, Marvel, for all that people talk about the sky falling in the comics industry, Marvel's making more money than ever. Oh, sure. Um, DC has had all of these eruptions, so I don't know what... But but DC was steadily increasing the amount of money they were making. Um, you know, what caused the, 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 the weird stuff happening at DC was 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 you know warner brothers screwed up was it i don't know hbo plus you know some right. some some rollout of some cable thing was screwed up and as a result there was a lot of money that was supposed to be there there wasn't there and they started looking for places to cut yeah um but it but again it was like you know when marvel went bankrupt in the 90s yeah. Marvel didn't go bankrupt in the 90s because the comics weren't selling. The comics were selling like gangbusters. Every every month, the, the corporate guys would tell Bob Harris, you need to increase profits by X. And Bob would increase profits by X, even if it involved hologram covers, even if it yeah. involved shiny shit. Um, no. Bob would find I, I, I remember. I remember vividly. But the owners of the company just kept piling on more and more junk sure. so sure. that they could buy other companies. They leveraged Marvel to the point where it didn't matter yep. how much money, you know, yep. so, 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 you know, we look at that as some sort of failure, but it was not a failure of making comics. It was a failure of being owned by people who, sure borrowed so much money based on your ability to make money that it eventually outstripped your ability to make money, even though they kept making more and more and more and more and more. Yeah. Um, I don't know yeah. how we, you know, we, 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 we got to this, this, this particular threat. Um, but, but when we, you know, when we talk about the troubles of the comics industry, um, we do, you know, we do need to be aware Financially, the company is doing okay. Um, it's just, it's just, you know, we look at a is there options could be working the way there could be a better for new readers to come in and discover self and and and, and also a way that it doesn't have to be this hard to make all that, you know, all the money they're making, how much money could they be making? <laughs> right. Well, but see, but that's always, that's always to me the, the frustration, right? Because as a comic book retailer, I think if only the publishers manage their brands more in a more sensible way, then we'd all be selling more comics and they'd be popular. I mean, I firmly believe, I firmly believe in my heart of hearts, the Spider-Man comics should be selling a million copies a month. 2 million copies a month. It should be because the character is popular and we know how to make comics that people like. Why is it that we're not selling a million copies a month? Now, I mean, I think that some of it it's because they oversaturate the characters, blah, blah, blah. We could, blah, 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 blah. It's a lot of blah, 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 blah. But. Well said. Blah, blah. We, no, I, cause I don't want to, I don't want to like rabbit yeah, hole. Yeah, no. Right. Take it, yeah. But, but I, I, I just think we could have been, they could have been, Marvel and DC could have been better caretakers of their own brands and been in a much more successful place than if they hadn't done a lot of the excesses because corporate interests were saying, you need to make 10% more profit this month than you did last month. 
And I'll, but I'll, fundamentally, that's the thing that broke comics to me and broke both the Marvel and DC comic, uh, the universes, as as that that the thing that lit us on fire, that lit you and me on fire in the first place, you know, because um, they're just IP farms for these big corporations. That the the universe doesn't matter as much, you know. Rock old man shouts at sky. Ah, clouds. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, I want to be contrarian here um, and yeah, just you know, go back even further and say, when you talk about being caretaker of your brand, yeah, you're already 10 steps down the wrong path. Um, I think yeah. that, you know, for, for all that, you know, Mark Gronwald was a great guy and a good writer. And, and, you know, he was a positive thing for Marvel to have. But Mark was interested in caretaking. Yeah. Jack Kirby wasn't interested in caretaking. Yeah. Jack Kirby was interested in making the next thing. Yeah. And, and, and we, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a worthwhile question where, you know, there are people out there making the next thing, but, but why isn't everybody trying to, why, yeah. why, why, you know, I don't know. We, 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 we seem to be straying into the, uh, uh, into the, 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 the place that all convention panels go, huh. which, which is we start out <laughs> talking about something specific and we end up bitching about the industry. Um, so, so, <laughs> oh, okay. Wait, so, so let me, so let me bring this back to your own work and, and can you talk maybe a minute about creator owned versus uh versus corporate work and and let's tie it maybe specifically to Astro City which you own yes you own Astro City I I own it and Brent and you know Brent and Alex are co-owners R right no exactly uh uh but it's not really in print at all right now it will be it's 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 coming back we have <sighs> You know, I when you asked me to be on this show, lo, those many months ago, right. I was confident that at that point, you know, we would have already announced what was what was happening with Astra City, um, and uh, between the, the 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 pandemic and the the general slow movement of everything, um, and my own, you know, fabulous disorientation. Uh, disorganization. Um, we're not at the point of announcing this stuff yet, but Astro City will be back in print. All of it will be back in print. There will be new material coming. Um, uh, I will. I will. I will do my best to give you material that uh, that that you can sell in your store. Um, and that, in fact, is the difference between creator owned and company owned. There was a period of years when I had done a bunch of work with Stuart Eminent. And the only part that wasn't in print was Superman's Secret Identity, which right. was possibly the best thing we did together. I wouldn't even say possibly. That was the best thing we did together. Um, and DC just, they weren't interested in 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 bringing it back. And eventually they did, you know, they did it in 200 page things and they got good response. They did a deluxe edition. Um, and I believe that it's still in print as a deluxe edition. And, and, and now we've got Batman creature of the night and, 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 you know, but I, I have to admit every time I talk to a publisher about doing something company owned, I, in the back of my head is always that point that, that when, you know, when I did Superman Secret Identity and I was really, really proud of it, it was unavailable for a very long time because I had no control. Um, so, you know, do I, do I want to do that? Um, when I stopped writing Conan, part of the reason was the realization that a lot of people 
you know, there's, there's been a whole scandal thing with Disney these days. Um, it was, it was partially the realization that I had a contract with Dark Horse that said that they would pay me royalties on sales. But the minute that that license ended, Conan Properties could license that material to somebody else. And I didn't have a contract with them. I didn't have a contract with Conan Properties. I didn't have a contract with whoever the next publisher was. I had a contract with Dark Horse and that contract would have been done. So would it make more sense to write Conan and watch my royalties disappear at some point? Or to write Superman where I know that Superman is going to continue to earn royalties? Or to write Astro City, where if it goes out of print, you know, even even if it takes a long time to get there, um, I can make a deal with somebody else, and I can be the moving factor in whether it goes, you know, whether it stays in print. Yeah. Um, that I mean, even going back, going back to 1974, Kirk Music, who was dis- discovering comics. It's, it was never lost on me that I could go into a, a, a bookstore and I could buy virtually all of Robert Heinlein's backlist and read them. And most of those books, well, maybe not most, but a lot of those books came out before I was born. And it didn't matter because if I wanted to pick up some book that originally came out in 1956, there it was on the book rack. But if I wanted back issues of X-Men, I had to go to the Million Year Picnic and I had to look at the back issue bins and I had to hope that they had the issues I was looking for. I had to hope that Daredevil 83 was going to be there so that I could read it. I didn't have to hope with Heinlein. I mean, these days, a lot of Heinlein is, I think, out of print. Um, But it's been a very long time. (laughs) At the time, I was looking for issues of Daredevil and the X-Men that were less than 10 years old. Yeah. But they weren't available. Yeah. No, so, it's, it's. Uh, I mean, I, I, I face this same thing here in the store, right? Like that you, you know, we originally, we were all back issues. It was, it was all back. It was just like the Millionaire Picnic yeah. back in the day. Uh, but we've traded off for, you can see, it's all book. It's racks. It's we're we're graphic novels now. That's that's the way to go. Uh, and but it frustrates me. But here's the thing: that you're... this or that isn't in print anymore. When I could keep selling it, I I know that I could I could have sold Secret Identity all of those years it was out of print. Mm-hmm. And and it always to me was like why can't why don't the why don't the publishers grasp that there's actually a market for this for the for the good part of your backlist, right? Like if, especially when you you've got these iconic characters. Keeping the good stuff in print just, uh, it just seems like a no brainer. I mean, look, listen, there have been periods of time where this book has actually been out of print for, by Marvel. That's you know, usually six months, a year at a time, but still, you think, how can you let this book go out of print of all of the books that you have? Well, there was a long time. I mean, <laughs> let me say nice things about Paul Levitz for a couple of minutes. Please do. Um, when Paul started DC's book editions, the DC Archives, Watchmen, Dark Knight, Batman Arkham Asylum. Paul took a very, you know, cautious approach. Those books had to support themselves and the money that they brought in was earmarked to keep them in print and yes. to print more books. Yes. And so over a period of years, Paul slowly built up, you know, Paul and the other guys at DC he was working with, slowly built up a DC backlist operation that was a major, major change from uh, from from uh, uh, the periodical business that they had been in for decades before that. They were still in, the peri- in, a, in a periodical business, but they'd added... Um, uh, a, 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 um, uh, a backlist business that depended on inventory management um, and depended on on tracking sales velocity so you made 
reprints of the material before you ran out of the material. And they were successful at it. And Marvel saw them being successful at it and said, whoa, books, let's do books. And they threw a lot of money at publishing a lot of books. And then the books sold through and all of the books, all of the money that came in on those books, they'd spent on other stuff. And they said, we don't have any money to reprint these books. <laughs> things. So when they had more money, they printed a lot of books. And then the books went out of print. And, and, and for a long time, Marvel ran their, 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 their backlist like, like, you know, Coke dealers yeah. um, that, that had sampled their own wares. Um, and there were people at Marvel, there are still people in places at Marvel who hate the idea of maintaining inventory. You know, if they could possibly arrange things so that the day the last copy of Marvel sells from the warehouse, they print more. That would be okay. But if they have to print more while there's still stuff in the warehouse, why are they paying to keep that stuff in the warehouse? And the answer is because it's a backlist operation. Yeah. Because because it's inventory management, because you want a steady stream of that stuff. Um uh, so 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 yeah, Paul took it very slow and yeah. built up a, a self-sustaining operation. Um and 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 Marvel tried to chase that really fast. Sort of like in reverse how, you know, the the Marvel movie people, you know, they made Iron Man. And then they made Captain America, and then they made Thor, and the they, the movies got bigger, and they started connecting, and 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 DC looked at that, everybody looked at that, and said, "We want to do that, but we want to do it all at once." And so you got, you know, the 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 Superman trilogy that by the end of it. You, 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 it was the Justice League in three movies. Let's go from here's Superman to, uh, you know, you know, here, here's the whole Justice League. Yeah. Or Universal tried to say, yeah, we'll do a Tom Cruise mummy movie and we'll spend right. so much time planting the stuff we're going to do that we'll lose sight of the fact that this movie has to be good. Yeah. Um, yeah. and so most of these things die because they're trying to rush it. Right. Well, and I, I would put to you that uh, I don't think that we can name a single brand uh, in comics, at least, that that succeeded without being evolved naturally. So Vertigo succeeded because it evolved out of a natural line of books. But any other thing like, let's say, uh, the Barkerverse. We we're talking about Clive Barker earlier, like mm -hmm. a bunch of Clive Barker superheroes. You know, it sounds like something on paper, but, you know, that lasted two years and then everybody went goodbye. We don't want that. You know, you can't manufacture uh, IP. It, it has to be created normally and naturally. I right. I mean, something like First Comics. Yeah. First Comics started out with, I think, like four books. Yep. But it wasn't a universe. It was four books. Four books, yeah. were strong titles some of them already had a previous existence because i think you know one of them came over from pacific yeah. and, and and stuff so that they 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 built a foundation and they built onto it and built onto it um uh whereas uh dark horse's comics greatest world was here's a big event here's the universe um and it, it too was something like four books but it was four interconnected books you gotta buy them all yeah and and within a couple of years of that we were down to like x and ghost right um uh because that's not how people want to buy comics that's not the reason they buy comics right if you sell them the fantastic four and then you say hey here's thor they go oh this is cool too yeah but you've already got them buying fantastic four yeah um uh if you try to do it all at once whether it's you're backlist line of graphic novels or your your interconnected set of movies or your 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 superhero universe um 
you are asking people to buy into a big expensive thing without knowing what that thing is. Give them one, you know, give them, give them one thing. Um, the, the, uh, the image guys, when they started out, they all did one thing. And after the, that one thing was hugely successful, some of them kept doing that one thing. And some of them said, let's, let's, let's do more things. Um, uh, and, and, you know, there are some of the image guys who lost sight of the first thing yep. they were doing while they were trying to do all the other stuff. Um, and then there were some who, who clung to that thing, you know, that, that, that Todd McFarlane is like, I made Spawn. Whatever else I do, I got Spawn. And Spawn is, is, is his foundation. And Spawn is still being published today. Yes. And Savage Dragon is still being published today. And yes. nothing from the other partners is still being published today. Yeah, I mean, didn't... you know, if you if you can't keep Youngblood coming out, yep. then they're yep. not going to line up for the other stuff for, for, for very long. And now we're at a place where, you know, sorry, Rob, he doesn't even own Youngblood anymore. Yeah, right, right. Uh, how Like, how wrong is that? That, that really disturbs me when I heard that one. I, I just, uh. how did Andrew Rev wind up with it? Of all people, right? Isn't, isn't didn't didn't anybody remember? Yeah. Um. But, yeah. but um. Yeah. It's just just you you want to do anything you start with you start with one thing. Yeah. Um. Uh. You start with one thing. If it works, you add another one. Yeah. But if you start with four things. And they don't work. You you don't you 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 you've lost your chance to course correct. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's probably significant that all of those uh, all of those early Marvel titles in the early '60s started off looking like monster books. Yeah. Because monster books is what they were able to sell, and to some degree, since their distribution company was owned by DC comics or owned by the same people who owned the DC comics. Yeah. They had to kind of stealth their way into doing superheroes right. or, 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 or they, 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 somebody would have told them, no, 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 don't do that. Right. Um, uh, so, so, uh, you know, the, it had to be done a piece at a time and it's easy to say, Oh, this will be awesome. We'll do these 16 titles. It's just like nobody's going to buy into 16 titles month one. You know, they're not even going to buy the 16 titles year one. Yeah. That that start with one thing, do it the best you possibly can, move, you know, and 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 build from there. Because then if that one thing doesn't work, you 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 haven't wasted all of your capital. Sure. sure. <laughs> you can now start another one thing. Sure. See how that one might work. Yep. Uh, if only they would listen to us. Well. Yeah. So uh so let's let's start to wrap this up here. Um uh there's usually two questions I have at the end, just sort of the final questions. Um the first one, maybe you've answered in in many ways here, is is, many is there anything is there anything in particular you want to plug or is there anything you just want to talk about that you've got coming up that people should be excited for? Hopefully Astro City. Do we have a date for Astro City? I I I, I have a date, <laughs> but I'm not able to announce it yet. Very good. Very good. I, I will I will announce it absolutely as as soon as I can. I have then, a, is it an imminent announcement? <laughs> um, I uh, you can't announce that. I understand. You know, I, it it always seemed foolish to me to make an announcement of when you're going to make an announcement um you know we'll tell you as soon as we can tell you okay um and and uh hopefully uh i will i will know when that is soon um but 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 boy the you know the pandemic messed a whole lot of things up sure uh, sure and it, and it created situations where 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 stuff that you could solve in a week four years ago you now 
you know, are dealing with people who, you know, publishing executives are always dealing with whatever is on fire at the moment. Of course. But now everything's on fire. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, uh, oh, 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 by the way, distribution has just blown up. Right. You know? I'm, sure, I'm sure that you can't, but can you say who's publishing it? No, I can't. No, okay. All right. I, mean, I know. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. I'm just, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to push because that's... Yeah. Well, that's I wonder, I'll, you know, certainly, you know, I can, I can promote the Marvels, the yeah. first issue of which is out. Yeah. I don't know what I'm going to do the next time we have to do a spinoff. I've already added a definite article and a, and a, and a, and a, and a letter. Um, so I, I don't know what the next. Then you have to add an adjective. So it could be the great Marvels or. Ooh, that's a possibility. That's, the, that's probably terrible. The great Marvels, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. The marvelous Marvels. I don't, I don't know. The it's a little on the nose. It's a little on the nose. Mrs. Mizell. No, um, uh, the, the, um, uh, but, but, you know, the, I, I, I asked if I could say this and I did not get a response, but since I didn't get a no, I'll no. say there's going to be a second printing, you know, oh, the, nice. first, the, the first issue of Marvels came out and apparently did Excellent. well enough going back to press. That's very nice. Second issue is about to come out. Um, uh, third issue, I think, is going to take... Well, I think the second issue is going to take people by surprise, and I think the third issue is going to take people by surprise um, because, you know, it's a weird book. Um, it's a weird book even to me where I, you know, in some ways I started out doing this book and it was like, uh, you know, I, 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 I want to do this big, you know, Tom Clancy-like thing, and now I'm going... And, and I'm doing this Steve Gerber type thing. What, what happened? <laughs> We're having fun. It's energetic. But how do we wind up here? Um, and and it, 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 I guess sort of like with Thunderbolts. Um, if you don't know where it's going, it's going to surprise you. Yeah. Uh, uh, so give it a shot. We're, we're, you know, the Submariner project I did with... Um, uh, with Ben Dewey is going to be coming out in, in in trade paperback, and if anybody didn't read that because it was a King and Black's tie-in, right? Um, well, the people who read it because it was a King and Black tie-in kept going, "Where's the King and Black stuff?" <laughs> um, because it's like a side component. It introduces characters who do something in King and Black. Right. But this isn't the story of them doing that. This is the story of how they became the people who could do that. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, if you like the Submariner, um, whether or not you had any interest in King and in Black, this is this this works as a standalone story. And man, the art and color is just stunning. Um, ben Dewey and I are working on uh, a Red Sonia story for this Red Sonia. Uh, red, white, and black, or black, white, and red. I don't know what it's called, um, but we're working on that. We're we're just on the verge of doing another story together. And yes, eventually, and when I say eventually, I mean sooner than that sounds, um, we'll be doing more autumn lands. Yay! Um, uh, you know, I'm 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 there are a lot of stuff that 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 I'm aim I'm doing is aiming at getting the, 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 the books, the, you know, the cool books I've done in the past, doing more of that, more Aerosmith is in the works. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Excellent. Uh, you know, and there are new things in the works, um, things that you might not expect from me. Um, uh, but, uh, but like I, when I agreed to this, I thought, I didn't love it. Um, and, uh, in my, we did this show next week, we were able to talk about it. But I can't just yet. Okay. Uh, but uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm glad to hear. I'm glad to hear some of those things are returning because those are those are all things that I like, and I, I, I like, I like, I like creators doing their creator own work. I mean, I like creators doing Marvel work too, but it's it's that's a weird thing to say when I'm holding up a book called Marvel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the other, so the other, the other, so and finally, basically, the final question. So we always have uh, uh, writers and artists who watch this series because they want to make comics themselves. I mean, that's a thing they want to do. 
if, if there was kind of a yes, single of piece of advice uh, that you would give someone uh, who wants to have a career in comics, um, uh, whether it's mechanical, whether it's philosophical, uh, what what might that be, Kurt? I have two basic pieces of advice that I like to give people. Um, they're both, you know, one of them is sort of educational and the other one is pragmatic. Um, the educational one is finish things. Yeah. That that literally, there's lots of books out there you can read about making comics. There weren't when I was a kid. Um, there are now, but it doesn't matter because nothing, nothing will teach you how to make comics better than making comics. I know. As much as I'd say, go out and buy all Scott's books. Please go out and buy all Scott's books. Yeah. Um, Make comics and finish them. If you spend all your time starting stories that you don't finish, when you finally get around to finishing stuff, you won't know how to do it. Um, Scott and I did 60 pages of the Battle of Lexington, and it was not a very good story. But we finished it. We ended it. And, and we got practice doing an ending. Um, and we did other stuff together that, that has never seen print um that that had endings and as a result when it came time to sell my first material and scott's selling his first material um we knew how to tell a story and that includes endings so so practice try things out experiment it doesn't have to be good it just has to be done um uh, because if you do something and it's no good well you learned don't do that again. Huh. Uh, but if you if you're paralyzed because you can't, you know, you you can't bring yourself to finish it, then you'll never know whether it was a good thing um, or 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 a bad thing. And you'll learn from the bad things as well as the good things. The pragmatic thing is this has changed a lot in in as as the internet revolution has altered our world. And you can make comics and you can put them on the internet and you can gather a readership without any publisher ever being involved except yourself. But if you're trying to break in at Marvel or DC or Dark Horse or IDW or, or anywhere, um, the thing you need to remember is that you are trying to supply the needs of the person on the other side of the desk that they have a job to do and that job is publishing comics, but it's not necessarily publishing your comics. Yeah. It's publishing the comics their boss wants them to publish. It's publishing the comics they think can sell. When I broke in at Marvel, you know, if you asked me what comic would you like to write more than any other, I would have said X-Men. But I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to write X-Men because Chris Claremont had been writing it forever and he kept writing it forever, ever since. By the time we got to a point where maybe I could have written X-Men, I didn't so much want to write X-Men anymore. But I wrote a review for the fan press of Power Man and Iron Fist, where the last paragraph was literally, someday Joe Duffy is going to read this book, and I pity the guy who has to do the book after her. I certainly would have no idea what to do with it. And after I sold a script or two, backup stories to DC Comics, I noticed that Power Man and Iron Fist was month after month fill-ins written by the editor. Maybe he needed some help. So I came up with a Power Man and Iron Fist story, and I, I, I wrote up a synopsis of it, and I sent it to him um, with a note saying I'd already written, I'd already been writing professionally for DC. I didn't mention I'd been writing seven pages professionally right. for DC. The, just that I'd already been writing for DC and he gave me a chance and I ended up writing that book for 12 issues. It was not a book I wanted to write. It was not a book I knew how to write. It was a book I wanted to read and it was, I wanted to read it as written by Joe Duffy. Yeah. So I tried to write it as if I was Joe Duffy, which meant it didn't work out so well. And it turned out that the editor didn't like what Joe was doing anyway. Huh. So he wasn't happy with it either. But he needed somebody to fill those pages every month. And right. I needed an opportunity. <laughs> so 
Um, uh, so, so look for where are new people breaking in? Where are those new names coming from? What are they doing? Um, uh, that, that, you know, when Len Wein and Marv Wolfman broke in, the place you broke in was doing things like eight page stories in house of mystery. Right. Um, so they did those cause that was where the opportunity was. Um, when they, when, when Marvel did a lot of fill-ins, there was an opportunity there for fill-ins. We don't do fill-ins so much anymore because you got to put them in previews three months ahead of time. Huh. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so it's always changing, but there are always new people showing up. So look at where they're showing up and see if you can figure out this publisher, this editor needs things. I will give him things that, that, that I would like to write that are the kind of things he needs. Cause you're not going to be able to convince him to do something he doesn't want to do or her them or whatever um uh because because you're nobody you know it's the same advice i gave alex is you you, you're not going to get them to revive marvel fame but more expensive just want to do it but what can you sell them you can sell them maybe this which is the sort of thing maybe they do want yeah um so 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 that is you know that's, that's that's half the job starting out. Um, it's all true that that every freelancer is a small businessman. Uh, you and I have been talking about business stuff for much of this conversation, and I don't want to sound too calculating. I'm certainly, you know, I focus a lot on on uh, on, on the art side of you know the the dream story as I want to do, but absolutely. But if you are an artist, if you are a writer, if, you know, even if you are a cartoonist who's putting work out on the internet for free, you are in charge of your career. Nobody else is. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who broke in at Marvel, worked at Marvel for 10 years, and then didn't know what to do because Marvel dropped them. Yeah. And it and they'd never figured out. How do I find my next job? Because they didn't have to. As long as they were useful to Marvel or useful to DC, the work kept coming in. Yep. I was very lucky to an extent in that I, you know, I, I, I sold something to DC. And then the next thing I sold to DC, um, the editor who bought it showed it to other editors and they said, wow, what a piece of crap. And I didn't get work from DC for another couple of years. And I, 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 I broke in at Marvel doing Power Man Iron Fist. And a year later, uh, I was out of that job too. So I learned really early that the company does not have your best interests at heart. The company has their best interests at heart. So the person who's going to be in charge of my best interests is me. And if you're yes. a freelancer, it's you. Yes. So, so keep that in mind. But... All that is secondary yeah. to finish things, practice. Yeah. yeah, love it. That's perfect. That that I that could not have been a better answer. Um, <laughs> Marvels was the book this month, and I Kurt, I want to thank you for 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 this. I I want to thank you for all the things that you do. I I want to thank you for your time today. I this was a I had a great time. I hope you had a great time as well. It's it's yeah. It's been a lot of fun. I I I, I uh, you know. I keep thinking that that you know, we 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 could have talked about creative stuff more and business stuff less, but 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 you and I have for probably what thirty years now yeah. <laughs> talked about business stuff a lot whenever we're in the same yeah. place. I think it's all but the business of comics is how you make comics and how comics get out. I like talking about the sausage because mm -hmm. it you know nobody else is talking about it. Um, but I, I really, I really do appreciate your time and I, I really appreciate the book and I'm really glad we were able to make this a selection. Um, uh, next Wednesday, uh, we're doing another one and we've got Delicates by Brenna Thumbler. Uh, this is the adult graphic novel club of the month. 
Um, this is a great book. This is this is a really great book. And Brenda's a really, really great creator. And it's going to be great talking to her. Uh, and then the Sunday after that, is that correct, Jordan? Yeah, is uh, is Young Shadow for the Kids Club uh, by Ben Sears. Ooh, it's all yellow. It's a yellow comic. Um, it's really cool. It's, this is a great book. Uh, and then next month's classic selection is Lock and Key. And we're going to be talking to uh, Joe Hill, Gabriel Rodriguez. And I believe that Chris Riel, the editor, will also be popping in for this conversation. And it'll be fun. It'll be great because we love having conversations about comics. We love talking about comics. We love selling you comics. We love comics. And uh, we hope you can join us in some of these, uh, some of this, oh God, comics experience. Oh God, what a horrible, I really shouldn't do that. Okay. Anyway. Thank you all uh, uh, for, for watching the show. Thank you, Jordan, for running the show. Thank you, my wonderful staff, for being my wonderful staff and letting me do this kind of nonsense. Uh, thank you for our sponsors of The Beat. And thank you for the wonderful, awesome Kurt Busiek for being our guest for and talking about Marvels uh, in all of the different ways that we did. Thanks for having me on the show. Very much so. We'll see you next month, guys.